Hi everyone, this week I've got something really special for you. I've got the first of a two-part interview with Seattle-based mortician Jeff Jorgensen. We're going to cover all sorts of questions surrounding funeral homes and what it's like to care for the dead. So let's jump right on in. So on today's episode of uh, Share a Slice with Sean, I'd like to welcome Jeff Jorgensen. Uh, Jeff is the director of a Seattle-based um, funeral home. Actually, can, can you elaborate a bit on that first, Jeff? Sure. Hi, Sean. Uh, I own Elemental Cremation and Burial, which is Seattle's currently only green funeral home. And uh, Seattle is primarily a cremation market, so the bulk of what we do is, is cremation services. And uh, we've been open since uh, January 2012. So basically, this is a green funeral home service, um, which is kind of an extra twist. But uh, I actually saw in another interview with you um, that uh, burial's not so, uh, it's just not as popular as it used to be, especially in a place like Seattle, because uh, there's no sort of like, not as many religious, uh, I guess, reasons to go ahead and go through the whole casket business. That's that's one component of it. Um, you know, I it's it's one of those things that it ranges from market to market, and a lot of people think that the lack of space is the main reason, and that really couldn't be further from the truth. Especially if you work in cemeteries, there's a lot of space to sell, uh, but not many people really want it. So it's primarily a financial uh, decision. Uh, religion, religion, and culture factors heavily into your decision to do burial at this point. However, you know finances are starting to weigh a little heavier in that decision, even even in burial markets. So, 2015, uh, by some accounts, is the first year that we saw cremation tip the scales to be the larger share of of the marketplace. So. Uh, I've got so many questions for you, Jeff, that I think that maybe right. we'd just dive right into them. So, Go for it. first of all, I've got some general questions for you. Um, so, I hear the word corpses, I hear the word bodies. Is there any kind of particular technical difference between the two in the industry? And uh, you know, what what's generally do you do you use when you're dealing with so, the deceased, uh, you know, relatives? So, I mean, in our marketplace in this area, we call them bodies. And uh, a corpse, you know, that's that's a good question as to what the connotation difference is between corpse and body. Um, I, I'm going to be speaking completely <laughs> off the cuff on this one because I don't know if this is true. But it's my understanding that a corpse has either some medical or forensic value. Um, whereas a body is just something that's left after you're dead. It does sound much um, more clinical or maybe maybe like, I mean, even a war, I guess, maybe you might have corpses or, or bodies. I uh, yeah, don't know. You know, I, I could just ask the Googles. <laughs> <laughs> that would be cheating. But it would be cheating. But, uh, you know, I, the short answer is that in my world, you know, I mean, we, we have bodies that we have to pick up that – we do removals of, you know, transfer them into our care. Um, we don't do much removal of corpses. Now, what that distinction is, I, I, I'm the expert. I should know this. And, and I have to confess, Sean, I, I don't. <laughs> so, and when, you, when you're talking about collecting the bodies, I actually saw, I think I, I, I don't know, I saw like a video uh, production with you in it. And... Um, they were talking about just how much, how physical this job is. I mean, people usually uh, don't think of that. You know, you uh, you might have heard that in the interview that I did. It was a wonderful interview for a, a radio show called The Really Big Questions. Oh, yeah. I think that was and, it. And it was, it was a neat day. But, you know, I mean, it, it is a physical job to... Uh, pick up people I, it's certainly i mean it it's obvious as soon as i say it but you know i mean they aren't all made the same you know you pick up a 110 pound lady that that's been wasting away from cancer versus someone who's 375 pounds that died from you know cardiovascular 
complications. That's a that's a very different workout. <laughs> so, and and if anybody know. knows anything about passive resistance, I mean, uh, you know, <laughs> I mean, it's different. I think trying to pick someone up who's you know still awake versus someone I, I've experienced this. You know, picking well, someone I mean, up who's asleep, they're all kind of floppy. It's it's hard to pick them up. Exactly. We're getting kind of. I don't know if we're freaking anybody out here, but I this is very well, technical. Probably, but. <laughs> <laughs> but it is a it is a podcast about death, dying, and what you do with the body. So they can tune out right about now. Um, <laughs> so you know you're absolutely right. Right, and we we get puns all the time in our business. Oh, that's dead weight, and yes, it is dead weight. Um, and that that term is is specifically what you're referring to. I mean, the picking someone up who's let's face it, passed out drunk. That's that's about the same. I mean, they're they're not helping you. There's no assistance. There's no, you know, that's just floppy 150 pounds. Yeah, definitely. There's no kind of balance there or anything. I, I, I have another mm-hmm. question here, actually. Yeah. Um, so I guess this brings me back to when I was growing up, you'd always have the undertaker. And he, he, he was always this, inevitably, this gray, sallow, uh, thin, tall British guy with a black top hat. I mean, maybe we've been watching different movies. I don't know. So, what, what's <laughs> sure. the difference between a mortician and an undertaker? Is, is there any difference at all? Well, yeah. So, undertaker is is a an archaic term, and you know, I mean that that is it does sort of evoke images of like you described, you know, a formal British heavy wool coat sort of monster looking uh, gentleman and I mean it, it's it's just an archaic term they're, they're one and the same you know mortician is mortician is a term that that's used more generally for someone who's licensed in our profession our profession actually divides into two licenses and it depends on the state or province that you're working in um, as to what those licensures look like but one is a funeral director and the way I usually describe funeral director is uh, someone who basically is an event planner um, it's it's wedding event planning on a on a compressed time scale and that's your licensure so you're getting permits and and um, documentation in order and filing death certificates and that's sort of the bureaucratic side but then on the other side if you're if you're creating an event, you know, a wedding or a funeral, they have all the same components. They have the big moment, you know, where you have the the big ceremony. You have a reception afterwards. You have, you know, all of the all of the different elements of that service, and that's what a funeral director does. Whereas an embalmer is the other license, and an embalmer is the person who actually prepares the decedent for that service. So embalming is a very specific procedure um, in which you replace bodily fluids with a chemical and for preservation. But embalming as a licensure encompasses something a little broader, and that is any of the repair uh, or to for like trauma, you know, whether that trauma is an accident or it's very specific from an autopsy, um, an embalmer will repair that body. So those two licensures sort of blend together to be a mortician. So a mortician is just a general term that refers to anyone who handles or processes the dead. And it's not quite as common as funeral director. That was really long winded, but there you go. That's technical. Now we know, you know, knowing's half the battle. Um, right. So Jeff, uh, can can you fill me in a little? Because uh, based on your picture here, you don't look like the you don't look at all like the you know seventy something sallow old martician or or undertaker. Right. But how old are you, Jeff? So I I'll be forty two this July, and uh, I got into the business when I was thirty one, and you know the the makeup of of our profession fortunately is really undergoing a dramatic shift at this point in time. Uh, for the first time in history, excuse me, <laughs> before I get emails on this, for this first time in modern history from about the civil war on, 
um, we're starting to see a real shift from male funeral directors or male morticians to female morticians. There's, I don't think we passed the tipping point yet, but there is the, the classes that are coming through right now are, are definitely shifting towards the female. It's getting a little younger. So, you know, we're, we're getting a lot of people coming into the profession that are, are more progressive or, you know, coming in in their, their late twenties, early thirties, which it's a little different than, than traditional entry into the profession because it used to be, I mean, your family did it and that's how you got into it. Uh, or, you know, you started out as a 17 year old as, as a summer job washing cars and you just kind of fell into it and stuck. Um, whereas people are coming into it as a second or third career now, which is really quite, really quite refreshing. Yeah, actually, that's something that I noticed right away. Uh, I thought it would be interesting to do an interview of a mortician, and I went on to uh, Twitter, and what did I find? I, gosh, I found a whole bunch of... A lot of 20-year-old girls. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A lot of 20-year-old girls. Uh, you know, a lot of them had very similar fashion sense, as far as I could tell. <laughs> but, Gothic crusaders. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not like absolute, <laughs> not like, you know, 1990s goth, like, you know, white makeup right. or anything. But we're talking right. like, you know, yeah, kind of dark uh, in their, their, their dress <laughs> and makeup. Yep. They're, they're, you know, yep. they, they seem to hang around medical museums uh, a fair bit or, or even work yep. at medical museums. Mm-hmm. And and a lot of them have books and they do radio interviews and I'm like, wow, this is this is yeah. kinda hip. What's going on? Here? Yeah. And and I, I know the people you're talking about, unfortunately well, not fortunately. There's no plus or minus. Those folks that you speak of in a in a generality are are good friends of mine and absolutely wonderful. Now that said, the morticians, the actual licensed people that I've seen on Twitter as a, a a general grab bag are sort of attention folks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a lot of them do seem to have books. Uh, that's that's something I noticed. But um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, uh, more power to them. I mean, it, they're, yeah, they are absolutely. redefining the field. Let me tell you. Oh yeah, yeah. No, it's. I mean, it's wonderful. I mean, it's something our industry, in in my opinion, in uh, needs. I mean, we we need that. Uh, you know, I don't think that's the general consensus among my my licensed peers. However, you know, that's how it's going. I, so enjoy I can, it. I can totally see some sort of movie falling out of this, though. What do you think? I mean, <laughs> based on what I I've totally seen, I, I mm-hmm. totally can. Kind of like Hackers, except it would be, I don't know, uh, <laughs> gosh, what would it be? Embalmers or something. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. The plot line is going to be kind of thin, but let's go for it. <laughs> So and and actually, based on what I've read about you, you started out in aerospace. Uh, is that I, correct? And then you just kind of made the flip. That that's kind of a an interesting yeah. change. Yeah, it's. <laughs> I my first career really was restaurants, and so the the departure from restaurants to um, funeral home is is not as great as one might think it's it's a very similar envi- environment you're helping people you know you're you're getting them what they need at uh, you know in a in a pretty short order and it's customer service and high touch high high contact environment you know i mean they're they're very similar the difference between restaurant and funeral primarily is that one you have to wear a suit and you work nine to five and the other you wear black and whites and work five to two. So, you know, that was, that was less of a a transition than, than my CV actually shows. I left restaurants to go do flight training and got two degrees in aviation uh, from an aeronautical school and was trying to find a job when I was getting done with college and there just wasn't a whole bunch open in 2006 in in uh, aviation and it was just a really really struggling market for me and I ended up taking a part-time job not a part-time what I intended to be a short-term job in a funeral home and just fell in love with it and just never left you know what they say, death and taxes, right? I mean, uh, absolutely. Funeral homes will always be in business. 
They will, although it's far more competitive than you might think. Um, it's it, you got to remember that any given market on the planet, any given space where where humans are dying, already has the capacity met. And if you stop and think about that, I mean. People die everywhere, and people are doing things with those dead bodies. It, it's not like that need need is not being met. So when you decide to open a funeral home, you are inherently opening a funeral home in a market that is currently serving capacity. Yeah, I guess that's true. I mean, it's sort of like uh, you know the water company or something. You need to. You right. need to get those, we're getting very technical and graphic here, but you need to get those corpses somewhere right. else. Right, right. And so uh, it is, I mean, if you look at it from a purely business standpoint, you look at it, you know, as a unit of measure, it, it gets really clinical and, and quite, you know, distasteful quickly. Um, and at the same time, the reality is there is a, a certain pie of death, as it were. You know, I mean, in the county that I live in, there's 12,000 deaths in a year. And those 12,000 families have to be served. Who serves those families is up to how you approach them in the marketplace. And so, you know, going out to, if you think of it as farming or ranching dead bodies, and that's, that's incredibly distasteful. But when you look at it as an opportunity to actually come to a family and help them on their terms with a situation that they unfortunately find themselves in, I mean, that's, that's what it really is. Yeah, actually, and we'll get more into that a little later on, um, you know, okay. basically, your strategy and, and the strategy of a lot of other people, uh, your friends in the um, order of the good death or a good death, mm -hmm. rather. I mean, it's the idea of making things, make, making us more comfortable with the idea of our, our passing or our, 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 our dying eventually. Right. For now, though, let's uh, let's get back to my questions because I've got okay. a few here. So, <laughs> sure. um, so first of all, um, do, do you actually live in the funeral home or, I mean, do you live in an apartment? What, what's going on with that living situation? Because there's another stereotype maybe going on here. So do do I live with the dead bodies is the question. And yeah, exactly. I mean... Uh, the answer is no, I don't. Um, that said, I mean, I have two offices um, in two neighboring towns here in the Seattle area. And... The care center where the bodies are, are kept is just south of town. And uh, I live in a, in a condo in, in one of those towns. So it's not a traditional model. I mean, the term funeral home comes from the home that the funeral director lived in. And I've worked in those where... I mean, I actually lived in a funeral home at one point. And, you know, I mean, it's... As weird as it is to people on the outside, it's a job, you know? I mean, it's it's a job like anyone else has in that you have to get up in the morning and you go and you meet with customers and you do your your business and your work and then you go home and go to bed. Um, now, where that bed is, I suppose, is, is a little different. But in, in our case, you know, I, I do a lot of work from home, especially in the evenings. Um, so, yeah, I do work from home. But, no, I don't bring home the dead bodies. Now, that's, a, that's sort of a relief. Uh, so are, are you married or, or yep. how, how does that work? Okay. So I, you, you're married. Do yep. you have any kids? No, we don't have kids. We've got a couple of dogs. Uh, we've got Buddy and Jack, a Greyhound and a Jack Russell. And uh, my wife is actually a physician. Ah, so okay. when we met, I was already in this business. And um, she's she's fairly clinical when it comes to to you know things like this. And so it it never phased her. And that's I, that's kind of where I was getting at from here because yeah. when I was preparing for the show, I asked some of my friends, you know, what are some of the things that they might want to ask? And one of them said, "Oh, well, you know, d d does he date? And if he does, does he, you know, does he bring <laughs> the girls back home to the funeral home? What's going on there?" Or, or, or I guess, <laughs> I guess I could make the question more um, 
more general, I suppose, uh, within your circle of friends, um, do you guys uh, experience any issues when it comes to dating? Like, do, is it kind of incestuous where everyone sort of needs no. to be comfortable with no. it? Or or am I just no. maybe more squeamish than the usual? You know, it, it's interesting. When I, when I was, I mean, I was single for uh, five years of of my career and you know people kind of look at you funny like really that's what you do and and most people tend to kind of ponder it for a minute and realize you know again as as a funeral director like at this point god it's been probably a month since i've seen a dead body um just because i've been swamped with office work and you know i have employees that go out and transfer them into our care and I have other people that prepare them and work the visitation. So I mean it's not like I hang around with the dead. And when you're dating and you tell people, yeah, I don't especially at the time when I was working for a corporate funeral home, I mean, I'd go months, eight eight months without seeing a dead person. So, you know, I mean it wasn't like I was it's just not as creepy as you think. And people kind of realize that when you're dating and you know it's it's all about your personality i mean you could be an accountant that's you know super trolly and you're far i mean it's far worse right i mean i i don't know it's it's not that bad if people actually the give charisma, you a little more credit yeah exactly you've got the charisma yeah. then it's fine and yeah. uh yeah i have another question here from a friend uh-huh. he, he wanted to know because you know you have the 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 I guess the embalming at um the the makeup etc. Um, do you first of all do you make up the bodies? Um, I certainly have. Yeah. So uh, yeah. he wanted to know: um, Have you ever been approached by a living person to ask if you could do her makeup for her? Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, you know it, it's interesting because I. I've never been a big proponent of, of putting makeup on the dead. Um, I, and when I do, it's, it's very minimal. And the reason being is there's no way. I mean, if, if, if a woman came up to me and asked me to put up, put makeup on her, that's not my profession. Like it is, it is one tiny component that I might need to do from time to time, but I don't work at a cosmetic counter in Nordstrom and that's what I do. So yeah, no one, no one would ask me to do that. It's possible Um, also that the bar might be a little different. I mean, you know, (laughs) well, the lighting is different for sure. (laughs) Yeah. That's why a lot of funeral homes have those, those pink lamps that sit next to the casket is to, I have no idea. Yeah. Yeah. Next time you go to a visitation, a traditional funeral home, note that they have like a reddish colored lamp. Speaking of uh, visitations, et cetera, Mm -hmm. um, have you, uh, I mean, I know everyone's probably dying to know, do do you have any like uh, experiences or have you heard of any experiences of kind of just crazy or wild situations in an actual funeral environment or or visitation? You know, um, you know, in one of your early emails, you you had mentioned to think of any crazy things. And I, I, I get asked that from time to time. And I've had some I've had some interesting ones, but they're never like I I I think you're imagining some dramatic, crazy throwing yourself into the grave moment or or or, the, know, or the corpse just sits up on its own. Yeah. As a rigor mortis. Nutty falls off the table. And the answer is no. I I have I haven't had any of those happen. Um, one of the first, not one of the first. It was early days, you know, first few months of my working in a funeral home. I had my first graveside that I worked on my own um, was a gay Star Trek funeral, which was just surreal because it, it just everything about it worked out to look like a sitcom. I got stung by a bee um, underneath my collar of my suit. And you had all these people taking pictures of the casket with these, you know, 
Star Trek emblems on them. I mean, like everything about it was just bizarre. So, I mean, that's one of the, the closest to like television comedy that I've gotten to. And that was, that was early on. Um, you know, you go to some of these services that are, are very traditional Asian, uh, I had a Korean, uh, pastor that passed away that, you know, had hundreds of people at the service and it's cultural tradition to, you know, express your grief sort of overtly. And so, you know, there were these six or seven women kneeling on the ground, banging on the ground, screaming. And and I mean, that's, that's pretty dramatic when you're not used to that. So, you know, that, that kind of takes you back, but really the craziest things that happen in, in a funeral setting typically unfold over months. (laughs) So you get these families that are just dysfunctional and crazy and, just the family dynamics that go into the arrangement and trying to take care of the services can just go into these just dark and bizarre places. And it's just like, Oh my God, is this what I signed up for? So it, it, it's kind of long winded, but I mean, just some of the strangest human interactions with grief and poverty and it's just weird. Yeah. Cause you're, you're kind of catching people at an odd time as well. I know that, uh. When I went to buy my house here in Montreal, um, I mean, we found one place that looked okay, but it had been on the market for ages and ages. And we asked why, and it turns out it was because the couple that lived there had recently got a divorce. So they were so Uh dysfunctional, they couldn't never agree on anything at all. So this, this house was on the market for years. It was insane. So I can only imagine how brutal things might get when you've got <laughs> conflicting wishes about the bureau about the i mean yeah everything. i've i've got one right now that uh the mother of the decedent has dropped off the deep end and dad is just trying to navigate his way through you know the practical and this isn't a gender thing that's just how this one's shaping up but you know he's just trying to make it through and, and create a a normal environment to navigate through. And I mean, they can't decide on what to do with the ashes. So she's going to stay with me until they, they iron it out. And I know that could damn well be years. Well, that's about it for the first part of this interview. Come back next week when you'll get to hear Jeff's reaction to one of my ex-girlfriend's desires to drink my cremated ashes with her coffee every morning. That should be pretty interesting. I think. Remember that you can find out about Jeff over at the Order of the Good Death website. The uh, site is orderofthegooddeath.com. We'll talk a little more about them in the second half. You can also check out his funeral home, Seattle's only green funeral home, Elemental Cremation and Burial, at elementalnw.com. All music for the episode is by Chromatics Music, K R O. M-A-T-I-K-S and is used with permission. You can find them over on SoundCloud. Remember, you can check out other episodes of the show over at shareaslicepodcast.com. Thanks so much for listening. Goodbye.